Revelation chapter number 11. We're going to continue our study here in the book of Revelation. Uh, and I'm excited for what's to come. Uh, I'm definitely uh, praying and asking for the Lord's uh, help this evening as we'll be talking about the two witnesses. Um, and we're going to get into the beast and, and some of those fun things, some of those topics that people like to talk about. Um, but So we're excited. We're excited to see uh, what God's Word has for us and, and continue to change and, and, and grow and, and direct our lives. Uh, so look with me. We're going to look at Revelation chapter number 11. And actually, let me make sure I'm in the right place here. Revelation chapter number 11. And, and so as we've been looking at the book of Revelation, uh, we've really been seeing the judgment of God upon the world. You know, we, we know that God is a good God. God is a just God. God is a loving Father. But God also has a standard. And God, God has a standard for the way that Christians and, and the world, he, he gave us his law. He gave us uh, a, a set of principles to live by, and he gives us all the, the abilities to live by it. And so in Revelation, the book of Revelation, we see a, a people group that just would not turn to the Lord. And, and so last week, we've been looking at the judgment. Last week, we talked about the, the mighty angel's message. And if you remember the messenger of God, and an angel means messenger, and we looked at the angel's message, and we saw how there was a message that we don't know any, that we don't get to hear. Uh, if you remember, there was this big buildup as this, this mighty angel coming in in, in, the, in the last parts of Revelation, and then he, he, he says these mighty words and, and thunderings, and, 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 and his voice is like a lion, and he, John's about to write, and the angel tells him, hey, don't write it down. And so it can be frustrating for us because sometimes we just want to know the answers in life, right? So sometimes we want to go and know exactly what God's plan is for us. But, but instead of focusing on what we don't know, we should focus on what God has revealed to us. And so we talked about how we should embrace the message that God has given to us. And God has given us a message. God, God has... Uh, commanded us to share that hope that is within us. And, and, and so we talked about that last week. So let's continue here. Revelation chapter number 11. Uh, we're going to break this up into two portions. Uh, Revelation is 1, 2, 3, and then uh, 4 through 14. And so let me read uh, verse 11 just, as a, a, just so we see the, the contextual flow of the passage. And the Bible says, And he... Uh, said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. And let's continue on, chapter 11. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. So, so John is giving like this measuring device like a reed unto a rod, and he said, Measure the temple of God. And verse 2 says, But the court, which is without the temple, leave out, and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. And verse number 3, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. So, so this is the first part of first part of the passage that we're going to be talking about. Look, look at verse 4. It gets into the two witnesses. In verse number 4, the Bible says, And these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God, before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have, the, these have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecies, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as oft as they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the streets of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, 
where also our Lord is crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they shall dwell upon the earth, and shall rejoice over them, and make merry, and shall send gifts to one another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered in them, into them. And they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven, saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. In the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake was, were slain of men seven thousand. And the remnant were affrighted, and gave glory to the God of heaven. And the second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. So the title of today's message is simply this, The Two Witnesses. And we're going to see the two witnesses, and we're going to break down these verses and, ex and really uh, expound upon their testimony and, and, their, and their ministry here on earth. Uh, so let's uh, pray and ask the Lord to be with us this evening. Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, Heavenly Gracious Father, thank you for a great morning service, Lord. Lord, thank you for all those in attendance this evening. Lord, I, I, I pray that this be a time that we, we really see you for who you are. Lord, we desire for you to speak to us in such a way that only you can. Uh, Father, I pray that we not just look at these texts as, as, as future history, but something that we can lean on and learn from and, and really, Lord, be transformed. Lord, I pray that you convict us of, of whatever it is that you want to work out in our lives, Father, and that you bring us to a better relationship with you. Uh, Father, I pray that you give me the wisdom to speak and, and, and to speak clearly and concise and, and that we just be, and that, that our lives just be a blessing to you, Father. Father, we need your help this evening, Father. We love you, and we pray all these things in your son's precious name. Amen. So, so here... Uh, when we talk about the two witnesses, God gave these two men a very specific purpose. Um, he said uh, in, in verse, uh, let me look at this, verse 3, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days. Uh, if you're not good at math like I am, I had to look this up. That's the equivalent uh, of three and a half years. Uh, and so we see that God has a very specific purpose for these witnesses. To share the word that God has given them and to, and to be a, a testimony to the people around them. And, and friends, I, I know that the two witnesses are, are talked about and, and, and we don't know who they are. And we'll, we'll get into all that. Uh, but when, when we put a very practical application on this, is that God has called us to be set apart for a very specific purpose in our lives. And, and, and then we are called to serve God, and, and despite the hardships that might come up. Uh, we're we're going to see that these, these, two, uh, these two individuals had a very strong testimony. And, and no doubt, they, they had a very special part in God's plan. Um, but they, they really they, they endured much suffering and, and, and really persecution. Uh, but nonetheless, they stayed faithful to the plan that God had for them. And, and really, that, that's God's plan for the church and, and for us as individuals, that, that as, as we were saved and redeemed, as, as we are letting our light shine, as we, we have our, our, our yearly theme here, as we are letting our light shine, we, we ought to reach others with the message that God has given us. But first, uh, before we get into that, let's look at, uh, the first two verses, and let's look at what, what the Bible is calling the measuring of the temple. So we, we got to set some groundwork here before when we get into these verses. Uh, let me read it, verse number, number one. And there was given me a reed, like unto a rod, and the angel stood and saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. So, we, we have to set some things in order. 
So that we understand that during this tribulation period, that Israel would come in and inhabit the land of Jerusalem, uh, that the Antichrist would reign and unite the world, and the Jews would be allowed to rebuild the temple. And so when we look at the history of, of the temple, we know that it started with the tabernacle, right? The, the tabernacle in the time of Moses. And then in the time of David, it, we they built the actual temple. Uh, the time of David and Solomon, the temple was built. And then if you remember, it was destroyed uh, when, when, the, when they went into captivity, when the Israelites went into captivity. And then it was later rebuilt around the time of Ezra. But then in 70 AD, the temple was once again destroyed. And still to this day, there is no temple, there is no Jewish temple in Jerusalem. So today, that area is actually under Muslim control, where the temple used to stand. But we know by the word of God, and, and I believe the word of God, that the temple will be rebuilt. That the Jews will inhabit that land, and they will rebuild the temple, and, and sacrifices would once again take place in the temple. And, and so the temple is a, is a, is a place, we know in, in the Old Testament, that, that sacrifices were made, and, and in the Holy of Holies is where the presence of God was. Now, now if you're wondering, uh, well, you said, uh, well, Pastor, I thought Jesus did away with the sacrifices in the temple. Well, he did. But understand these, that, that not all Jews had accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. And so there are actually, there's many Jews today who are emphatic about uh, inhabiting the land and rebuilding the temple and setting all that up. And there, there are many things in place currently to actually plan to rebuild the temple. And, and so many Jews, no doubt, would believe on the Antichrist and see him as the Messiah, and the Antichrist would allow this worship to take place. And so that's what's going on here. That, that in, this, in this time period, the temple has been rebuilt. Sacrifices would take place. And, and, but frankly, you know, God has something to say about that. Uh, so look at verse 11, where it says, There was given me a reed, like unto a rod. So there was this rod, this measuring device. And the angel stood saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and then that worship therein. And so, so this, this, this idea of measuring, uh, and so sometimes in the Old Testament, the idea of measuring communicates ownership, protection, and preservation. Uh, we see this in Habakkuk, uh, the idea that the Lord owned the earth and could do with it as he pleased. And when, the te when this temple is measured, it shows that God knows the temple and that he is in charge of the temple. And not only that, God can do with it as he sees fit. And it says, measure the outer court and leave it without. And I'm not going to get too much into that uh, this evening. Uh, but we know that it says that the Gentiles, those who are not Jewish, would come and trample the city and, 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 take, and they, they would take control and for, for three and a half years. It says for 40 and two months. And then when we, and so that's what we see about the text talking about the temple. And we'll get into more of that as we later on in our study. But really, I want to focus a majority of our attention this evening on the two witnesses. And so we take a pause out of the, the judgments. We know that we are up to the sixth judgment or the sixth trumpet, and the seventh trumpet will come actually next week. But we, have to, we take a pause and we see the ministry or the testimony of these two witnesses. And let me just say, the, the two witnesses is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. We know that Christ came uh, and lived a perfect life, died for the sin of the world, but his ministry was three and a half years long. And this is the, the length of this ministry of the, these men here. And God gave them great power uh, to these men to prophesy and, and to have control over the rain and, 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 and the waters of the earth and plagues. He gave them great power. And, but later on, we'll see that they're actually going to be martyred and raised again. And so who are these two witnesses? Well, for, frankly, we don't know. Many believe that it is Moses and Elijah uh, because of the similarity between their ministry from the Old Testament and these two uh, individuals' ministry. Uh, they believe it's Moses and Elijah. 
Uh, we see good reason for that uh, in Malachi 5, you know, that God promised to send Elijah before the great day of the Lord. In Matthew 17, 11, Jesus said that Elijah would come and restore all things. Uh, I mean, so there's good reason to believe it's Moses and Elijah. We really don't know. Uh, my personal opinion, I, I think it could be Elijah and Enoch because they, neither of them saw death and these two men would come back. Or they could be two, two people who we've never met. We, we really don't know. Uh, but point is, it, it matters less who they are and matters more what they did for God. And to keep that in mind as we live our life, it, it matters less who we are and matters more what we do for the Lord. So let's look at this ministry. So, so it, number one, God gives them power. Look at verse number three. The Bible says, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. And, and so God gave them the, the command to prophesy, to tell them the word of the Lord, uh, no doubt to tell them the wrath of God that is to come. Uh, but he also said that he will give them power. And the, the application in our lives is that God will never command us to do something without first giving us the ability to do it. I, I think of Acts chapter number 1, where, where God told his apostles to be witnesses unto him, but before, before he, he, he gave them that command, or before they were able to execute that command, they said that they would receive power and that the Holy Spirit would come upon them. And so the so point is, is that when God gives us a, a, clan, a plan, when God gives us a command, He has already set up a way for us to execute that plan. He already knows A to C. He already knows everything that we need. He's already got that all set up. Our job is just to be obedient. I, I, mean, I mean, I think of when it comes to sharing the gospel. God will not give us a command without first giving us the ability and the foresight and the, and the wherewithal to complete that plan. I mean, if we are called to share the gospel, we know that we all have the ability to share the gospel. We understand that God has given us that ability. I mean, the thing that might be lacking in your life, we talked about that this morning, is the desire to do so. Or, 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 or even so, the faith to trust God and to execute whatever plan he has for your life. But understand that God has already got the plan mapped out for you. No, no, so, so when God calls us to something, you know, when, when God called Moses uh, to lead the Israelites out of bondage, God knew from A, B, C, D, E, F, G, all the way down to Z, he already knew everything that would take place from the moment that he called them until the moment where they were out of bondage. He knew A to Z. God, God knows the A to Z in our life of what he's called us to do. Uh, but but what, sometimes what we're missing is we talked about the desire, and sometimes what we're missing is, is we, we don't walk by faith, right? These men, in order to complete the testimony, the, 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 the charge that God had given them, they had to walk by faith. So make sure that you are constantly seeking him. And then in our lives, as we continue to live our lives, whether it's at work, whether you know, we become soul winning, whether, you know, whatever it is that you're doing, we make sure that you're following the Lord, seeking him, but also make sure that there's a certain humbleness about you. Uh, look at verse number three. The Bible says just the last two, three words there, clothed in sackcloth. So sackcloth is cloth, which, which sacks are made. Um, but what we see here is that when we see in Scripture, when people are, have sackcloth on, particularly in the Old Testament, it's a time of mourning, distress, mortification. I, I think of in uh, the book of Esther, well, when the Jews, uh, what it, when it was told that their people would be wiped out and that they would be annihilated, they went to God in fasting and prayer and they put on sackcloth because of the great distress that they had. Uh, and it's, 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 it's really what it is. It's, it's a great, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a visual representation of your distress and, and how much you need the Lord. And so when these two men are clothed in sackcloth, you know, I, I believe what the connection is here is that they are called to prophesy to the Lord, but they are really, they're lamenting over the words that they're saying. I, I mean, if they're called, if we, if we look back onto these people, uh, the Bible says here, let's, we see verse, um, 
Uh, let me see here. I probably can't find it now. I just thought of it now. But there was a point uh, in the scripture. Oh, here, here it is, actually. Uh, chapter number 9, verse uh, 20. And the rest of these men, which were not killed by these plagues, look what the Bible says, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. The Bible says, Neither repented they of their murders, nor their sorceries, nor their fornication, nor their thefts. And what it was just talking about before is how God sent the armies to torment them, and to many, many people were killed. And so what's my point, what's my point in saying that? It is no doubt these men saw the fate that the world, those who are, who are, who are here, would fall in. They, they, they would see the judgment of God that was before them. And so there, there, there's no doubt a, a sense of, of, of mourning or distress in, in, in the call to repentance that the, no doubt they preach to them. Uh, how, let me just back up a little bit. If, if we are, when we share the good news with people, when we're reaching out to the lost world, there, there should be an element of care for that individual because we know what happens. I mean, we see it all in Revelation, in the judgment of God. We know what happens if they reject the message of Christ and continue to live in their sin. So we see this, this, this message that they proclaimed, and we see the attitude that they proclaimed it with. But, but when, also understand this, is that when God calls you to do something, God will preserve you. God has his watchful eye upon you. He, he cares for us. Look at uh, verse number, number 5. And if any man will hurt them, the Bible says, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. If any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Look, look, there, there, there's many enemies of this Christian life. Well, we, we know that the three enemies of the Christian life are the world, the flesh, and the devil. And they're, they're constantly out, out to get the Christian and, and back in these days, and especially back in the, the times of First Peter that we're looking on Sunday morning, there, 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 there was a great persecution of Christians. And many Christians were killed, and many were scared for their faith. But understand this, is that when God has called you, and when God has a purpose for you, He will take care of you, and He will preserve you. And, and we'll, we'll talk about, you know, there, there, are, there are those times... Where, where it seems like something wicked or something horrible is happening to somebody or us or somebody that we know, but really we, we see that God is using it for good. And so God takes care of us. And, and we, we know that the vengeance is of the Lord. The Romans twelve nineteen says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. And so God loves his children. God, God, God wants great things for his children. And although God may allow these people to do horrible and wicked things, understand this, there will come a time and place where according to Scripture, the Bible says that vengeance is of the Lord. So he will preserve you. Uh, he, he, God will take you and preserve you, and, and keep you, and, and keep you safe. Uh, and the, 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 the saying is true that the will of God will never take you where the grace of God cannot keep you. And so God preserved these men. I mean, if you think about the wickedness of these men and, and all that they did, and, and how much they wanted to kill these men and, and do horrible things to them, they had no power because they had God on their side. So God will preserve you. And, and really... So sometimes we, we really have to stop trying to figure every little thing out in our lives. Sometimes the reason why we don't take action and sometimes the reason why we don't step out in faith is, is because we, we want to know the plan before God gives us the plan. And the problem with that mindset is, is that if we want to know the plan and know how everything works out and, and, and know how, how, how God is going to work everything out, the missing thing that God wants you to understand is that God wants you to just trust Him. He just wants you to trust Him. Uh, I think of Matthew 6.34, it says, Therefore take no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take uh, thought for the things of itself. 
sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. And in Matthew 6, 33, the verse before it says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So not only was there a special provision, special guidance, a special protection, these men were given power. We, we, we see that the power that these men have. Verse 6, the Bible says, These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, and smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. So, so they, I mean, think about it. They had the power to stop the rain. I mean, we complain about rain. Uh, this evening, it's exact, uh, this evening, in fact, uh, we were stuck in the rain here for a little bit, weren't we? Uh, we, we let those, if you left church early this morning, you, you kind of missed a downpour. Maybe, I mean, maybe you got it at home. Maybe you did. But we, we were staying, chatting in church, and um, all of a sudden, it just started pouring this evening. And I'm looking, I'm like, I'm wearing, I'm wearing this, and I'm like, I'm not going out in that rain. Are you, are you kidding me? <laughs> I'm going to get all wet. Um, and then I have to get, let my clothes dry and yada, yada, yada. But, I mean, it can be an inconvenience at times, but really, r rain is a blessing, right? Because, I mean, it allows crops to grow, vegetation, all that, all that stuff. And, and these men, the Bible says, have the power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. So, so they had the power to stop the rain from falling. And not only that, the, the, pres, the, the water preserves, they had the power to take them away. Uh, keep reading. And have the power over waters to turn them to blood. Uh, I, if water turns to blood, you can't drink it. I, I mean, they're just, they're just, it's just no good to you. So not only they, could they have the power to take away the rain from the sky from falling, the, 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 the water that was there, they had the power to take that away too. And not only that, and it says, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. So, so God gave them a very special power to these men. And, and really to prophesy the word of God and, and, and to uh, have great authority over, over the earth and, and what happens with it. But, but something happened, right? And, and sometimes in our lives, it, it can seem like everything is going great. It, it can seem like... Uh, everything is just hunky-dory, and all of a sudden life hits us, and we don't know what to do. Uh, I mean, I think of, you know, we understand that this life has highs and lows. I, I think we all get that. And, and we all want our life just to stay at a high place. I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. We, we want to live rich and fulfilling lives. We want that. But there comes a time where things happen that don't go the way that we thought they should go. And really, when this happens, it can be discouraging. It can be, uh, it can be troublesome to us. But understand that God is still in control. And what I love about the Word is, is that it, it, it's very clear and very uh, truthful as the hardships that come about life. I mean, you would think that these men, uh, you know, nothing can hurt them. They they have power over the rain and. And, then the, and turn water to blood and, and plagues, you, you would think that their ministry is just going to go absolutely wonderful. And although uh, uh, troubled times do befall them, we see that God is still in control. And let's look what happens. Look at verse number 7. The Bible says, And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them, and kill them. And so all of a sudden, their ministry is doing really well, in the sense that nobody has hurt them. You know, it doesn't say that people repented, it doesn't say that people turned towards God, but, but it seemed like God had just been preserving them, and, and, and keeping watch over them, and gave them power and ability. But all of a sudden, it says, when they had finished their testimony... And let me just say this, is when God has a plan for us, there's nothing that can stop us from fulfilling God's plan. Nobody in the outside can stop God's plan from coming to fruition. And so it says, when they had finished their testimony, it says, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And so the beast comes out, overcomes them and kills them. 
And not only that, look what happens. Verse 8, And their bodies shall lie in the streets of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where our Lord was crucified. And so that's interesting. So they're in Jerusalem, but it's called Sodom and Egypt. It, it just goes to show Sodom and Egypt were two places that were very, uh, uh, very wicked. And when you think of Jerusalem, the holy city of Jerusalem, it just goes to show how much, how wicked that city has become. And verse number 9, the Bible says, And when the people and kindred and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves, that they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them, and make merry, and shall send gifts to one another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. So not only were they killed, it says that their bodies were put on display, that they sent gifts to one another. I heard, I heard uh, some commentators call these beastmas. You know, the beast came and killed them. And all of a sudden, people are rejoicing. Hey, hey, these, these two men that, that were telling us of the wrath of God to come, that they were proclaiming the word of God, hey, we finally got victory over them. They're, 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 no doubt, the Bible doesn't say what they said, but I can just imagine that, uh, that they, their sins were being called out, and then they were telling them of the wrath of God to come. And finally, they had achieved victory over them, and they were killed, something that no doubt they were trying to achieve all along. And, and, we, and if, you, if, you, if you stop reading there, it seems like the enemy is winning. It seems like God's plan went to ruins. It seemed like everything fell apart. But regardless of what the enemy has in store, God will always win in the end. God will have the ultimate victory. And, and so uh, this beast that overcomes them, you, you, you might think, why, why is God allowing this to happen? Well, we have to consider God's purpose. And God's purpose is to show his glory. We, we know that God ha is, is, is his his purpose is also the salvation of man, and he seeks that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the reason that God created man is, yes, to have fellowship with him, but, but for us to see the glory of God. And, 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 and if the, and the sufferings of this world, something that you know, we've been talking about in Sunday mornings, that the sufferings of this world, if, if, if a result of the suffering is that we see the glory of God, then the suffering is all worth it. Because we see how great, how mighty, how awesome God is. Because it's easy to say that you trust God when things are going easy. But when things go bad, it becomes a lot harder, doesn't it? And, and when, really when things go bad, it's, it's the greatest opportunity to cry out to the Lord. And when he saves us from a hopeless situation, I mean, we just see God in such an entirely different way that we didn't see him before. No, I would say my God is great, but when I see God get me out of thing after thing after thing after thing, we say, man, how great God is. And so in this circumstance, it might just seem like, man, this beast finally showed up. The beast finally showed up and finally got victory over them. And, and, and yeah, yeah, God, God's plan went to ruin. Well, I, I don't think so. Look what it says in uh, verse number uh, 11. And after... Three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them. And they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. So three and a half days later, these men were resurrected. And, and, and can you imagine that they were, they were giving gifts to each other, and they were celebrating and saying, Hey, we finally got rid of these men who were saying all the, that all these bad things were going to happen, which they, they should have listened, but they were celebrating nonetheless. But what actually happened is three and a half days later, after they made a mockery of them, they came back from the dead. God resurrected them. I mean, we see, see just this glorious miracle. And, and, I don't, and I don't know about you, I, I, I don't know how the, how the Pharisees and the religious leaders felt when they finally thought that they were rid of Jesus, that this man that caused them so much trouble, that, that uh, called them out publicly for, the, for their, for their uh, adultery and, and for their uh, evil, wicked ways, and they finally thought they were finally rid of Jesus, and they, I'm no doubt they were celebrating. 
but God had a plan. And God had a plan that from the beginning to raise Jesus up from the dead and be victorious over death and sin. And so no, no doubt after Jesus was raised, I mean, these guys must have been pooping their pants. They, they thought, hey, we, we, thought, you know, we thought that we got rid of him. We thought we got rid of the one who was tormenting us, but he was raised from the dead. They might have said, oh, I guess he was really from God. Oh, we really messed up. No doubt this is the reaction that I imagine that these men felt. And, and so evil will always lose in the end. Those who do wrong, but the day is coming. And, and, and we, when we think about, you know, and if, we, if we back up a little bit, if we, if we think of the situation where, where these men are, are, where it looks like victory, uh, where it looks like the enemy has victory over them, just remember this, that death is a door to eternal life. The, the Bible says that, that uh, if we have Christ within us, if we have accepted him as our Lord and personal Savior, the Bible says that to die is gain. Now, that all these former things, all these uh, stresses, all these heartaches, all these things that we deal with in this life, we will be together with the Lord. And that, that is the ultimate deliverance that we can see. You know, sometimes we think when a family member or somebody dies and, and we think, oh, man, they, they, I wish they would have just survived and, and beat whatever they were dealing with. But, friend, if they know the Lord, then they're in the best place that they could possibly be right now. They've, 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 they've gotten ultimate deliverance from sin, from death, from disease, from all those things. The Bible says that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so no doubt God had given them great deliverance to these men and showed these who tormented them and who tried to kill them and all these things that they had messed up. And verse number uh, 12, after it says, And great fear fell upon them. Verse 12, And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their, well, look what it says, and their enemies beheld them. They, 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 they watched this happen. And imagine a voice from heaven coming from the cloud saying, come up hither. And all of a sudden they start ascending up to heaven. And, and I'm, I'm sure they're looking at each other going, are you, are you, are you seeing what I'm seeing? They, they, not only did they come up from the grave, look, they're ascending up to heaven. And I just think that the, the, I could not imagine what they're thinking at this point. But, but look at uh, verse number 13. Look what happens afterward. And the same hour, the same hour, the same hour that this happened, and the same hour was there a great earthquake. And, a, and the tenth part of the city fell. And in the earthquake were slain of men 7,000. And the remnant were affrighted. Look what it says, and gave glory to the God of heaven. God's purpose was completed in these men. And when all hope might have seemed lost to those who uh, are, are, are for the purposes of God, God's plan was completed regardless. But, but what's, what's crucial to this, and it says the la that last part of verse 13 where it says, and the remnant were frightened and gave glory to God of heaven. The fact that men see this glory and see God for who he is and are drawn closer to God, that is worth all of it, Christian. That is worth every single uh, suffering and bad thing is, 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 is when we see the goodness of God and how great he is. And, and so to wrap up, when God gives us a task, when God commands us to do something, be assured that God will give you the power and the ability to complete that. And God will preserve you. God will carry you. God will strengthen you in such a great and mighty way that only he can. And I understand this, regardless of anything that might befall us in our life, God is working all things for our good, for his glory. And, and, and in the book of Revelation, uh, a great summary of the book of Revelation I think if we go back to chapter 10, we're looking at verse 9. 
the Bible says, And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. So it's talking about how the word of the Lord, the prophecy that is to come, it's glorious to see how God is working, even in the last days. It's glorious. But it's bittersweet in the sense that we see the reality of what befalls those who refuse to trust in the Lord himself. And that's really a great summary for the book of Revelation. Is that, man, we look forward to that day when we can be together with the Lord. We look forward to that day. And, and, but, but we also don't look forward to all those who haven't trusted Christ. But, but we, what we know, what we understand is that these events are still in the future. That there is still plenty of opportunity for the, all, all those to, who haven't accepted Christ to accept Him as your personal Savior. To realize your sin and come to a saving knowledge and call out to Him and say, Lord, save me. There's still that opportunity. So, so let's make sure that we're taking a hold of every opportunity while we still can. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we we're so thankful for the truth that you revealed to us in your word. Uh, Lord, thank you for continuing to speak to us. Uh, Lord, I pray that you continue to use heritage to, to reach the lost and, and to reach um, those who need the Lord. Lord, I pray that you continue to strengthen our relationship with you and to grow us and to preserve us. Lord, continue to keep us safe. Lord, continue to just work in each every one of our lives. Father, we love you, and, and, and we pray that you keep us safe as we go home. Lord, we're thankful for all that you've provided for us. We love you, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.